This is CBC Here and Now. The business community says the House of Assembly should reconvene. The last time I spoke with Richard Alexander, we had 28,000 jobs gone. Now it's 35,000. Stay tuned. We were down significantly. It has been difficult, but uh, we're trudging through it as best we can. Car dealerships have taken a hit during the pandemic. Tonight, we look at how they're coping and trying to bounce back. Good evening, I'm Peter Cowan. We're looking at the economy tonight and calls for the government to start focusing on the economic crisis facing the province. The provincial government announced today measures that it hopes will make it easier for local businesses to win government tenders. Finance Minister Tom Osborne says tipping the scales in favour of local companies may end up costing the province more, but he expects that cost will be outweighed by the benefits of more local hiring, spending and taxation. Osborne also said these changes will not make it easier for politicians to help companies that donate to political campaigns. By keeping the business local, we keep people working, we keep the economy going and the return to the Treasury um, will offset in large part the, uh, the difference in the 10%. Um, the politicians uh, don't provide the, the ratings on tenders. That's done very independently by a, uh, a team of, of uh, officials in any particular department. Well, the business community has come to believe that it's time to recall the House of Assembly to save what's left of Newfoundland and Labrador's economy. Joining me now is Richard Alexander. So, Richard, what's the urgency? Well, they've been highly focused on the, the public health emergency, and rightfully so, right? They've, they've, they haven't flattened the curve. They've obliterated the curve, essentially. But there are two other emergencies in this province that they need to be uh, talking about, uh, the economic crisis and the fiscal crisis. And right now, there's a lot of decisions that are being made that impact generations of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians because of those two crises that are being made essentially behind closed doors without transparency. And in a democracy, the way these things are supposed to be decided is, is in a House of Assembly. So debate it, explain to the people uh, what's going on, how, how, what the situation is, what is the government going to do about it. And the fact that those decisions are not being made in the House of Assembly is in a democracy is quite frankly as frightening. But given the fact the opposition has so far been more or less on side, it's been one team, the focus has been on health, what's to be gained? Well, I, I think there's other provinces across the country. New Brunswick uh, debated whether or not they should borrow another $2 billion in their House of Assembly. That's how our democracy works. Uh, but, you know, the opposition has been, quite frankly, been silent on this. So if the opposition wants to be the next government, okay, well, explain to us what, what do you think should happen? You know, should we spend all this $2 billion, uh, every cent of it? I mean, the, the decision to, to borrow that was made back in March before we knew what the impact of COVID was going to be. And, uh, you know, what happens when we get into the fall? Do we, do we go and borrow another $2 billion? We need, we can't wait for a new premier. We need uh, a, deci a decision now. We need a plan now. We need our House of Assembly to open and debate these important, important issues. Focus has been, and they've done a good job on the, on the public health crisis. They've really focused on that. But, you know, if you, if you borrow $2 billion that you, that you can't afford, but you, you have to do it, so we had to go to the Bank of Canada to do that, um, the impact of COVID has been much less than, than what people thought it was going to be or feared that it was going to be, then, uh, you know, do we need to spend every cent of that right now? Should, we debate, should the, the House be debating that? We were in a dire fiscal situation before COVID hit. Uh, we were worried about going over the edge and we said, you know, there's, there's only one little thing that could happen in the, in the economy that could put us over the edge. Uh, we had two. We had the drop in the price of oil and we had COVID-19. Uh, so how far over that edge are we? Uh, we're going to have to, to take steps to, to deal with that. And uh, the, the finance minister and the premier, they need to, to be honest with the people in a democracy. But th doesn't the political ethos right now seem to you, whether it's the Conservatives or the NDP or the Liberals, we're looking at a bailout, and so we'll just throw everything on the bailout tab. Well, you're flying a plane, and the plane is crashing. And, uh, you know, what, what's the plan? Without, without government coming out saying how bad the situation is, without government saying there's a brighter future ahead, we're going to take steps to control, to mitigate the impact of COVID right now. What sorts of phone calls are you getting from your members? Oh, it's, it's uh, I get up in the morning, my phone starts ringing, it doesn't stop until the evening, and uh, it's, it's, it's desolation out there. It's, it, people are very, very concerned. Um, you know, the, the, the sense is that it, things are, are switching now. So everybody was really concerned about COVID-19 and the public health crisis. 
and uh, you know we've like I said we've obliterated the curve we haven't flattened it uh, but we have the probably the worst fiscal situation this this province has ever faced we've got an economic crisis we're starting to hear things about the economic crisis let's let's get our let's get our politicians to talk about what they're going to do to uh, to keep our our province solvent all right mr. Alexander thank you very much my pleasure thank you well, some good news for Richard Alexander. The House is going to sit starting next week. The Premier announced today that it will reopen on Tuesday, June 9th. Well, there will be uh, at least four pieces of legislation and, and potentially more. So you probably see about a couple of weeks in there that will start on next Tuesday, but a very different looking House of Assembly next week. And a very different looking future for the Premier. We now know that Dwight Ball's days in the top job are numbered. The Liberal Party will have a new leader and the province will have a new Premier on August 3rd, about three months from now. The party released details today for resuming the leadership race. Two candidates are vying for the job, a surgeon and son of Liberal Senator Andrew Fury and former Deputy Minister of Health John Abbott. Both announced their candidacy in March before the pandemic shut down the province and halted the race. The party said campaigning can resume on June 8th, the day the province is expected to go to alert level three of the COVID-19 pandemic. The party will hold a virtual convention with online voting on August 3rd. And well-known journalist is joining Andrew Fury's campaign. Fred Hutton is leaving VOCM to work with the campaign. Hutton has also worked for CBC and NTV. The Information and Privacy Commissioner is criticizing government for destroying documents central to the controversy around Carla Foote's hiring at the rooms. Commissioner Michael Harvey says government failed in its duty to assist with an access request made by Here and Now. It interpreted the request too narrowly, he says. It shouldn't have deleted an email with documentation telling the rooms to fire a person so Carla Foote could be moved into a new position. Now, she's the former Liberal staffer and daughter of the Lieutenant Governor. She has since been moved back into government. Harvey was also concerned that government had no record of its involvement in this decision. He said if other records were not created in the first place, this raises concerns of proper record keeping. The lack of responsive records mean no official records of these decisions were created. This is not a reasonable approach to good governments. Well, back to the COVID-19 epidemic, and it is another day with no new cases of COVID-19. It's now been four days in a row. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are following most of the advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, but when it comes to face masks, many are still wearing, aren't wearing one rather, in places like supermarkets. Dr. Janice Fitzgerald says you should wear a mask because it could prevent you from spreading the virus if you have COVID-19 and don't realize it. It's recommended for places where you can't maintain two meters of distance at all times, like the grocery store. Many people still aren't doing it, but Fitzgerald says they should. You know, we have to think about this in terms of protection of other people and that if everybody is doing it, then it protects all of us. So, so I think, uh, you know, we need to keep reinforcing that message and, uh, and we do recommend that if you're in a situation where you can't physically distance and especially as we're coming up onto level three and we're thinking about uh, public transportation, for example, and people on Metro bus um, is something that comes to my mind right off the bat. And speaking of shopping, the automobile sector is trying to rebound. Auto sales in this province have plummeted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But as here and now's Terry Roberts reports, the industry managed to avoid a total collapse this spring because of a little creativity combined with our infatuation with vehicles. Spring usually means sales for the auto industry. But with dealership showrooms locked up tight because of the pandemic, business plummeted. However, the industry did not collapse. We were down significantly, but we we're still able to um, sell a significant amount of vehicles. Dealers sold 900 new cars and pickups in April, about one third of the business they did for the same month last year. But proof they were able to adapt to a crisis. I would definitely not say that the bottom dropped out of the business. It has slowed down, but uh, to say it was a collapse, I think would be an exaggeration. Sales consultants turned to technology doing virtual appraisals, sending walk-around videos to customers, making deals online. It has been difficult, but uh, we're trudging through it as best we can. 
these new challenges have definitely uh, tested our our ability to adapt quickly and make changes quickly, but uh, we have a fantastic team working together. And dealers are slowly bringing back employees. But 2020 is a year like no other. We made some quick changes. Uh, it was a very emotional time. And this is what the new normal looks like. Deep cleaning before and after every test drive. And strict physical distancing measures inside their showrooms and servicing departments. We're doing everything we can to make sure that people are comfortable and that our staff and the public are protected. And mixed feelings about the possibility of reopening showrooms next week. We're very excited, but very cautious. <laughs> With so much economic uncertainty, no one is expecting a return to pre-pandemic business levels anytime soon. And that's unnerving for a very big industry, one that routinely sells 30,000 vehicles every year and employs nearly 2,500 people. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Looking at the U.S., more than 40 cities across the border are under curfew, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Atlanta. Go, friends, tell your brothers and sisters, we will not win this fight with guns. It's not going to happen. we got to be peaceful. Tens of thousands of police lined the streets overnight, backed by about 5,000 National Guard troops in 15 states. More than 4,000 people have been arrested in six nights of protest since the killing of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer. While there have been scores of peaceful marches and demonstrations, there has also been widespread damage. Americans living in this province are watching the situation in the U.S. intensely, and the protests have also sparked a conversation about racism here. Here and now's Heather Gillis explains. There's a sign of solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protesters in the United States here on Barnes Road in St. John's. Americans who are living in the province, such as Kim Phillips, are closely watching those protests unfold at home. I, I'm sad of the destruction, I'm sad of the violence, I'm sad of the people who are going to be injured and hurt. We gotta be peaceful! Phillips is encouraged that the social movement is happening. I don't think people fully understand how much racialization is a part of the fabric of the United States. Phillips has had her share of experiences with racism, from what she calls daily microaggressions to questions about her ethnicity and being told that her English is good. My best friend was African-American, and we got chased by a group of white supremacists. It is something that we can trace back to the history of slavery. Up to Paul Ajay is an associate era, professor at MUN. He researches anti-black racism. Ajay says protesters in the U.S. are angry about the lack of accountability when it comes to police brutality. When the very institutions and the structures that are supposed to you know, provide law and order are the very institution that is complicit, you know, in anti-black racism violence. Even though people here feel far removed from the protest and the province has a reputation for being friendly and hospitable, Ajay says racism is prevalent here. Somebody scream N word at me on the street. Honestly, you know, I was speechless. I... Ajay says he finds watching the protests painful and says it makes many people of color relive the pain and agony of racism. Uh, what is this unforgivable blackness that many white people do not want to go, let it go? I, I really don't understand. You throw them on the floor. He says when someone shares their experience with racism, it's best for allies to listen and not to discount, dismiss, or rationalize the experience. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau opened his daily COVID-19 briefing this morning by denouncing racism and discrimination for uh, those who took advantage of these peaceful protests uh, to do significant damage. Um, we have to condemn uh, those actions strongly. We need to continue to make sure that peaceful protest is always uh, able to happen in Canada. A man who assaulted his girlfriend, then evaded arrest, has now been sentenced. Ashton Kennedy turned himself into police following a CBC News story last month. Now he'll spend the next 60 days under house arrest. Kennedy slapped and pushed his then-girlfriend, Melissa Gulliver, in December 2018. He admitted to it and started to go through the Family Violence Intervention Court, but Kennedy stopped showing up for counselling and stopped reporting to his bail supervisor. 
Yesterday, he pleaded guilty to breaching an undertaking by doing so. Three other charges were dropped. Well, today is the deadline to file your 2019 tax returns. Taxes are typically due at the end of April, but the deadline was extended due to COVID-19. If you're self-employed or have a partner that's self-employed, you have an extra two weeks to file. That deadline is June 15th. Good news, if you're running behind, you won't be hit with a penalty, at least not yet. Even if you owe money, you won't be charged with late filing fees or interest if you file before September 1st. Well, the winds have certainly picked up this evening. This is generally going to continue across the island as we head through the next couple of days along with some pretty wet days ahead as well. I'll have all the details coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Hundreds of motorcyclists turned out for a memorial ride over the weekend to pay tribute to a man killed in a car crash earlier this month. Chad Pitcher died after a driver who fled from police crashed into him. As an avid motorcyclist, a ride was held in his honor on Saturday. Have a look. Chad was a great guy. He was one of us. <laughs> Attended all the fundraiser rides and helped out with charities and everything else his group did. 
the biking community here within the metro region and the Avalon and in the New Flan in general is a small knit community. He's also one of those ones that comes to it every week. Every Sunday and Saturday we see the same people there. We knew Chad Tredetta. I also knew him through family. Great guy, great people. And all these are here to go to their hearts. We put conditions in place to live within the COVID gui guidelines that we all have to do today. And uh, we said we proved that this could happen. The bikes, as you can see, are head to head. So everyone, there's no one sitting side by side. Everyone are keeping to their bubbles. Those are, are not are keeping their masks on. I have my mask on. I was talking to people, and everyone's keeping their distance. I don't know the numbers on the bikes, but I'm estimating a thousand bikes. This is probably the biggest ride that's ever been put together in Newfoundland. We were expecting a couple of hundred bikes. We weren't expecting anything like this. Well, Chad's our body man. You know, got to keep his memory alive, right? The best kind you'll ever meet. What was he like as a person? What was he like hanging out with go riding? Well, out of one to ten, fifteen. But this what happened, it was a senseless act that happened. Uh, nothing could change that. It could have been a child walking across or a mother with a stroller at the same time when his car come through. But every year in May, accidents happen with bikes as people don't see the bikes. In this situation, this person didn't want to see the bike. Didn't want to see anything. He was just driving recklessly. But at this time of the year, there's accidents day after day after day. The people who don't see bikes, and now all of a sudden the bike is there. They don't realize this, this, this vehicle is on the road on side of them, and they hit them. Every day there's accidents. So there's two fold with this. This is out of Memorial of Chad. These people are all Chads. Everyone here, man, woman, child, is a Chad. We're on our bikes every day. We go home to our family. Chad couldn't get home to his family every day. So we're trying to do this in memory of Chad and also to prevent it from happening again to somebody else. Weather update is brought to you by the sold-out HCF Home Lottery. Thank you, Newfoundland and Labrador. Your support has been overwhelming. Prize winners will be announced on June 25th at hcfhomelottery.ca. What a weekend we had in eastern areas of the province. We actually today uh, marked a four day streak of temperatures in the 20 degree range. Let's take a look at those temperatures. Last time this happened was uh, back in 1999. So we saw uh, today, as of earlier this afternoon, 21.5 degrees in St. John. So yes, four days, beautiful uh, afternoon for sure, but that temperature has certainly dropped. We've got a number of areas seeing highs in the teens and then up into the single digits up through Labrador. But like I said, that temperature dropped now sitting at 15 degrees uh, in St. John's and about eight in port of bass Cartwright. You're sitting at about four degrees right now. So we do have a, an area of low pressure bringing in all of that cloud cover. Lots of moisture with this one as well. And that's going to generally continue as we head through the night tonight. We are looking at periods of rain, which will be heavy at times, certainly along the south coast through central, eventually eastern areas of Newfoundland. We'll see those periods of rain as we head into the overnight in the first half of tomorrow, certainly. But uh, that rainfall warning is in place from Port of Bass through to the Buren Peninsula. That's where you're going to see the majority of the heavy rain tonight. And then it'll taper off to showers uh, through the afternoon tomorrow. But then you'll see late day again. We'll start to see some more periods of rain move in, certainly for eastern areas of the island. And then up through Labrador, you see up in uh, northern Labrador as well as Lab West, we're starting to see some of that blue and pink in the mix. Cooler temperatures in the upper atmosphere means we could see, or more than likely, we'll see some periods of rain mixed with some snow into the afternoon. So this is what uh, we'll be sitting at. This is from now until tomorrow morning. Another 20 to as much as 30 or 40 millimeters along the south coast. That will continue through the day tomorrow, bringing some of these uh, accumulations up to 50 to as much as 75 millimeters of rain. And that, again, will continue through Wednesday. Your temperatures will be pretty similar to what we're seeing today, or at least right now, into the teens. Those winds, because of that area of low pressure, just sitting south of Port of Bass there, uh, generally looking at southeasterlies, and they're going to be gusty, 50 to 60 or even 70 kilometers per hour, but generally light winds up through uh, Labrador, certainly for the coast, and a little stronger for Lab West. Not much of a change in the forecast for Wednesday. Might see a few more peaks of sun in play, but overall we're still in that flow. Lots of moisture, and those periods of rain will continue for the east. Look at our temperatures as we head into the end of the week, or beginning of the weekend, rather. Uh, in, back into the 20s, potentially by Saturday. Friday looks lovely at 18 degrees. And then for western and central Newfoundland, you're looking at temperatures generally in the teens. And uh, Friday by far looking like the best day 
of the week and then up through uh, western and eastern Labrador you're looking at temperatures in the single digits for you in the west again some snow in play pretty much through Wednesday and then uh, we're looking at some sunshine returning for Labrador by Saturday uh, eastern Labrador rather just wanted to show this great shot of the sunset looking over Champneys East Holly Stag sent us that lovely shot if you have any weather photos share with us on the NL photos at cbc.ca Back to here and now. Investigators say a bird strike may be what brought down one of the Canadian Forces Snowbirds aircraft last month, killing the aerobatics team's public affairs officer. Canadian Air Force crash investigators issued a preliminary report today. It says video footage shows a bird in close proximity to the right engine intake when the plane took off in Kamloops, BC. Captain Jen Casey was killed and Captain Richard McDo McDougall rather, injured after they ejected. They were taking part in a cross-Canada snowbirds tour dubbed Operation Inspiration and the plane was destroyed on impact. Completing the investigation could take months or more. Well, the St. John's Farmer's Market will reopen in two weeks and it will be a little different, but the vendors will be there. 
The executive director says they've been told everyone can return when the province reaches alert level three, set for next Monday. But the setup in the market will be new so people can abide by physical distancing requirements. That includes more outside vendors and the seating area for the cafe will be removed. There will be limits on how many people are allowed inside and aisles will be one way. Well, tonight we want to leave you with a video of just how great Newfoundland and Labrador can be sometimes. Let's take a look. Well, this was taken last week by Jay Hickey in Northern Arm Holyrood while he was kayaking. The whale surfaces right next to his kayak. A whale's been putting on quite a show in Holyrood for the past week or so. Someone needs to teach that whale about physical distancing. To keep at least two meters away from the kayakers at all times. So quite the sight there to see. Thanks so much for watching. That's it for here now tonight. I'll be back with you again tomorrow. Have a great evening, everyone.